Afternoon, Sean. Hello. Um, this is Sean Thomas. And Sean, uh, you're an actor, you're an actress. And the reason that we're talking today is because uh, you work with Mike Alfreds and I'm doing a series of talks with Mike about his life, about his processes, about his work, about the way in which he works with actors. And also in parallel with that, I'm also uh, talking to people who've worked with him. Mm -hmm. and, um, and one of the things that Mike said to me, you know, when, when I suggested that I talk to other people um, that he's worked with, he, he said, well, don't, don't, you know, it doesn't have to be a hagiography. It doesn't have to be, oh, Mike, he's such a god and he has, he's so wonderful and all that. <laughs> So, you know, if there are any warts mm -hmm. that you want to talk about, you know, I think warts are legitimate as well. Warts you, are good too. Okay. You know, you, there might not be any, but who knows? Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, we were talking on the phone the other day and I kind of gathered from you that, that you had known about Mike for some time before you actually got to work with him. Is that right? Yes. Um, it's a very long time ago. <clears throat> I lived with Mark Rylance when he was, we were both very young, um, way back in the <clears throat> early 80s, I guess. Um, and he knew about Mike and Mike's work. And I think we went to go and see the Arabian Nights together, one of quite early productions and thought it was extraordinary, but it was definitely via Mark. And then Mark got cast as the Madame in The Maids, the Jean Genet. And I think Ra Rai was one of the sisters and John Dix, so it was just the three of them. And Mark was the Madame who comes in towards the end. And he was, well, they were all brilliant, but he, he just was extraordinary. Um, and I'd never seen, I'd worked with him a little bit, we met through work, but I'd never seen him be quite so, bizarre and thrilling and the whole the whole production was and so I think Mike was there that night so that's probably when I met him but after that we began to go and watch more productions and at somewhere along the line I met Mike and I don't remember the exact meeting but that's how I how I got to hear of him now I'm puzzled because are you saying that Mike directed the maids that's what I can't remember. I don't think he did, you see, because... No, I think... I, 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 There's a big question mark, but he was definitely... It was for shared experience, and it... I, I, I don't know who did if he didn't. That's it, the thing. it was probably post his time there. I mean, because he never talks about that production. So I'm presuming then that he, it wasn't his production. We might have to go back to Mike and make sure about that. But mm. I think that might have been because, you know, he passed the, passed the baton on. Um, he had but that was much later, didn't he? No, when he I think passed the baton on. Oh, for goodness sake. I mean, you know, these, these things get lost in the mists of time. This, I mean, Mike this must have been about 1980 19... something. 80. Yeah, one or two, I would think. Right. Okay. I and, know, maybe he, because he did sometimes get guest directors in. Yeah, maybe that's what it was. Because uh, I did another <laughs> production, very unlike working with Mike, years after with uh, Giles Havergill, who was brought in as a guest director. You couldn't get anyone more different. I mean, lovely, but very, very different from Mike. And he was brought in as a guest director. Oh. Anyway, that's... That's the first link. And then I would go and see, like, The Seagull and um, with Pam being brilliant, Pam Ferris, just glorious, wonderful, sort of inspiring. And La Ronde, I remember seeing, uh, even more extraordinary. She was just breathtaking. I just wanted to be Pam Ferris, really. <laughs> and I'd really... I became a kind of devotee of, I didn't really know that a huge amount about the work, but just of the result of the work. And did, 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 so you, you sort of saw these productions and, and felt that there was something different about them? Yes, there was a great freedom and a great 
relish and life and they, they were happening in front of you. It was such a kind of, everyone was alive to each other. It was not dead and not being phoned in. And the best people were spellbinding. And even the ones that weren't quite as good were, were still feeding into the scene. It was shared and alive and uh, organic. And I can't remember when I actually did first work with Mike, how I got the job. I don't remember auditioning for him. Maybe he'd just got to know me through Mark and seen my work. But I remember being thrilled when I was asked. So I, I had a, an inkling of what I was getting myself into, but only an inkling. <laughs> okay, so, so had Mark Rylance actually worked with Mike by then, or was that later? I think that was later. That was later, yeah. yeah. I think that's true. I think that's yeah. right. It didn't work until quite well, a bit later. Oh, in yeah. fact, the national, maybe. Anyway. Yeah, it... I think so. Um, it, because they had got to know each other and made done workshops and things, I, yeah. um, it felt as if he had by the time we went to the national. But I'm not sure if Mike hadn't done the maze, which was the question mark in my mind, then I don't think that Mark had done a production with him. Mm. But they'd certainly got to know each other. And, and I, you know, the sort of devil in me was to say, are you sure that when you're talking about the seagull and La Ronde that you, that you saw and Pan, that you're not retrospectively kind of glossing it with all the words that you've used about spontaneous, not dead, all those mm. things that you've subsequently learnt about Mike? Or would you claim, yes, that was exactly how I was responding to those pieces? Yeah, no, I really would claim that's why I remembered I remembered them and why I was kind of on the trail of him rather than just thinking, oh, that was all right. Oh, who was the director? You know what I mean? It was sort of like homing in on, oh, I must go and see something else like that. And... I know Pam's mentioned it because I've, I've watched her interview, um, but I was going to mention it anyway because it, I was there for that moment when she's our gardener and she's having a row with Constantine, her son. And it, it, it was just completely brilliant. I thought, God, that's wonderful because it was so creative, so true, and yet so outrageous all at once because our gardener is, and it was an absolute example of being in the flow in the moment when she's having a huge row and it was very, very emotional and angry, this particular rum. And she just happened to pass the mirror and she just caught something. Sort of, it, it wasn't cold, it was just, oh God. Like, and then back into it, and I just thought, God, that's brilliant. And you knew she hadn't planned it because it was instinctive and, I think the audience laughed, but, but it wasn't particularly funny. I mean, it, it, it was, but it was just, as an actress, it was thrilling because that was so Arcardiner like And it's the kind of thing you think of doing, but you don't. And it just, that's what I began to realise was the freedom that you can do things like that with Mike's work, with, if you earn the right through the rigour and the, the character work and the, you know, yeah. All, all the work that you do on the text, it releases something in you at the time to find things that you would never have found if you'd gone home and planned it. Um, truthful things that come out of something much deeper in you. And the, the tension, I think, between playing your objective very strongly and the power of the moment or the preoccupation. I mean, in rehearsals, he makes you do these things called points of concentration, preoccupations where you you don't just, well, you, you don't sit and block and, you know, plan anything. You you run an, a whole act and there's a great wash, like, like a kind of wash on a, or a, a watercolor painting, you just go, and you've got the memory of that. And things are released because you're, the, the tension between playing your absolute objective of that scene and yet the preoccupation of whatever it is, love or the weather or money, some, something to do with the play usually, it's a theme. And 
you don't have time to worry or think. Things come out of you that you just can't imagine um, or plan. Sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes you make a complete twat of yourself. And, you know, people say, oh, that's what rehearsal's for. But you do that in, in performance too, um, because no, nothing's ever set. But you're kind of layering up wonderful choices all the time, which you can, it's like I always think of it as a sort of great lake inside you, where you're, or a bank. It's more like a kind of lake where you're, you're just layering up infinite choices through all the different washes or runs that you do on the, um, on the text. And it's water rather than um, a discrete sort of bits of jewellery. So it, it, you, in a way, you're talking about the watercolour idea. Mm. The danger maybe is, and I think a, a, a other people have talked about this, you know, do you just kind of, oh, look, that was a good moment I had in rehearsal. I'm going to pick that one and and kind of place it. I think that's the that's the danger. Um, I mean, I think there is that possibility. And occasionally, I suppose, if I'm completely honest, maybe I've done that or one does. Um, but it's more a sense of who the character is, of the infinite possibilities of, of their inner life and who they really are. You just keep exploring it and you explore the play itself through running and running, but always finding something new, being forced to because there's nothing set and because you're, you're having a new point of concentration. Um, and so I think, I don't know, I think, I think in the end, it just makes for a much more rounded, um, certainly sense of character, and plus all the wonderful character work that you do. And you're using performance energy from the beginning, which is always thrilling. You don't sit around and talk around a table for weeks. He gets you up and doing immediately, which I find quite thrilling and scary, but you're forced into kind of high energy commitment to the play. And you, um, well, you, 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 it's not, it's not that you're trying to cheat and, la and layer up interesting things that you can cherry pick, but you're, you're slowly enlarging who you are and the choices that you could make or the feelings that you're getting from the play. It, it enriches the play, but at any given moment um, or any production, in any performance, you are starting from a new point and things will come into play to help you that you've done before, similar things, mm. but you are free. And it's a huge responsibility to, um, to keep that going. Sean, I, I, um, there's so much I want to unpick of what you've said so far before we even move on to your first encounter with Mike. And one of them is um, the following. Uh, as a young actor for myself, I never had a director, I think in my whole career, I stopped acting when I was 30, who said, you know, what's, the, what's your objective in this scene? What, what do you want? What do you, what do you, what's your intention? What are you pursuing? And so I don't think, except on a very kind of instinctive level, I, ever, I never had a director who was kind mm. of doing that work with me. And so it's been, uh, it's been quite interesting for me. I mean, I've done a lot of teaching myself and a lot of directing myself, and I've used the idea of objectives a lot. Mm -hmm. and I've mm -hmm. sort of understood them myself. But it would be so interesting to hear, number one, whether you have had that experience before you started working with Mike, and number two, what it meant to you, and what, 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 how do you play an objective? <laughs> Nutshell, I hadn't really worked with a director before then who'd said, right, what's your objective? Nay, your super objective. 
and let's action the play and things like that. Yeah, I just I didn't know what any of those things were, apparently. Um, and Mike, at first, it, it, the, the, the very first production was a, a shawl play, which is quite wordy. Um, it was too true to be good for shared experience. Um, but overtly, it was a very comic role, which I think helped. But I can remember thinking my head was going to explode um, because there was so much, there was so much work. He really works you hard. And just to understand what an objective was um, and that you play each little action to achieve an objective. So you have an objective for each scene and an action gets you to that objective and then there's a objective for an act and in the end you can have a super objective which is what your character secretly craves and wants more than anything else and again it's all from the text you don't kind of go home and think oh, I think she had porridge for breakfast you you know you really it's detective work which all these things were thrilling um but new to me and so it was it was hard work. It was very, very exciting because I realized that I did those things without knowing what they were called. He gave me a language and a structure to a kind of instinctive way that I worked, but he suddenly gave it form and much more meaning and a seriousness that everyone had to share, which again, is thrilling. You're all in it together. And the best of times, everyone is together in that togetherness. It, it can sometimes not be quite so together, but um, at its best, it's, it's thrilling. So for me as a young actress, it was wonderful to suddenly have someone who understood how I worked and could name it for me and give me a structure to work forwards where it became scary was suddenly you were off the book quite quickly and because you did quite a lot of work on text and lots of exercises and all the lists for the characters what your character says about herself what she says about other people what other people say about her if you have a big part you practically write out the whole script but again you get very you you, you kind of filigree the, the script and you get to really know it quite well and my brain was young and spongy so you, you could before I knew it I knew my words I'm not sure if I'd be the same now but then you start doing these runs and I that was frightening I remember thinking I can't cope with this he wants me to be different every time and, and nothing's the same and it, it, it was terrifying and I was all over the place having really enjoyed the work so far and Selena Cadell was in the company with me and she'd worked with Mike at his first national production the um, cherry orchard she was in that so she had worked with him once before and she just whispered to me I think doing notes or just in rehearsal before we went off to do yet another long wash she said Shani don't panic you're panicking aren't you and I said yes I am I, I can't remember everything I'm doing and I, I I don't quite know I've lost the thread I don't know why I'm, I'm just endlessly doing stuff choices she said put your mind put your head down into your gut stop judging it stop trying to remember everything and control everything but put it down into your solar plexus or your gut and just allow things to start growing there and trust that you will arrive at a very rounded, good place and that you're going forwards, but don't try and analyze and fix now. And for some reason it really went in and it changed everything. And the next day I walked in and I said, like, literally like a door had swung open inside me and I got it. And then I couldn't be stopped. It was, I still remember how thrilling it was. It was just, I couldn't wait to get up and do another run, another point. It was just like being a, from being someone who kind of just 
walking along at a pedestrian crossing. I was on a trapeze. It was absolutely life changing. And I, I guess the work was good because I, I seemed, Mike seemed happy so long ago. It's difficult. And it was my first experience of him. And, and I, it was sort of revelatory. Um, and he asked me to go to the National with him quite soon after that. So uh, I guess what I was, it felt wonderful, but whether I actually was, I don't know. I knew I went right out on a limb with my character. Well, let me tell you. Outrageous. Because, because so. I was assisting Mike on that production. Oh, yes, of course, I'd forgotten that. Yes, 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 yes. Well, you know, well, that meant that I just sat there for however many weeks we rehearsed. But, um, but How stupid of me. Of course you were there. Um, but I do remember the amount of energy that you used to bring into rehearsal, Sean. I mean, it was, it was, it was really, you, it, I kind of have an image of you sort of, not floating isn't quite the w right word, but you're on a sort of surfboard or something. You know? Yeah, it's just what it felt like. And, uh, you know, and I think I could see the pleasure that you were getting out of it. <laughs> which, you know, again, if we're not going to be hagiographic, not all the actors did get that pleasure. No. Um, and some, you know, I felt were were wading through treacle. Mm -hmm. You know, it was an effort, and it was it was it was a, it was like they were being dragged into a world that they didn't want to be part of. And I I know this partly with Mike because when I was a bit younger than than when we did Too True to Be Good, I auditioned for him. Mm. I did a week's audition, and. All I did in that time was block everybody. Really? Yeah. And I mean, I, I looked... Did you know that you were? No, not really. I sort of thought I was just being very cool, mm -hmm. you know. But basically, I was just blocking. Yeah. Blocking... Withholding. All, all these improvisations that we were being given. What I was, what I was good at was showing what, the things that I was good at. You know, showing mm. off what I could do, mm. what I couldn't do, which is what links with what you're saying about um, uh, Selena Cadell's opening that door for you, is staying in control, you know. Yeah. Demanding you stay in control the whole time, which, of course, is very dull, actually, in a way. Well, it's quite, in theater. Yeah, it's boring in the end uh, for, for the person in control, but for the people watching. Yeah. Um, but it's, it takes a lot for most people, including myself, to, to let go, to, to, to take that, that risk, to, to, to just go on the trapeze. And that's what Mike gave me. It, it, was, it was wonderful that, that you're there to, to be my witness because it really, it did kind of change everything for me. And it stayed with me in many guises and, sometimes working with very different kinds of directors. But um, it's about play and it's about receiving as much as giving, mm -hmm. um, really understanding the space between two actors. It's what you do to me and what I do to you. And it's what happens between us mm -hmm. that is alive, that is thrilling. And the only way you can find that is to be brave, is to be open, is to take risks and not to control. Yeah, and 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 that thing of, of actually seeing the other person on the stage with you. Whereas, mm. you know, when you are blocked, it's like, you know, you're in your little masked world where you're yeah. getting right for yourself, as it were. Yeah. But you're not actually making that engagement with the other person. Mm. And I think it often makes people much more nervous when everything's blocked and set and it's it's if you've done the other way which sounds terrifying but actually it's very freeing it's very rigorous it comes out of a great discipline and great rigor and that's the thing that people don't want to do and fall by the wayside but if you are prepared to do the work that mike asks of you and that you need to do for yourself you then gain the right to have this wonderful freedom um and, and then, again, maybe because I was young as well, things get different when you get older, but I never got nervous. I never got stage fright type terror nervousness, I, um, which I have had since a bit. 
uh, not too bad, but you just get more fearful, the more careful you're being. And uh, it, you were so busy just living on that stage that you didn't have time to think about being nervous or that you were not doing what you should have done because there, there was no should. Mm. There was only what happens now. Mm. And it makes you be in the moment. You, you have no choice. But I, I can see that it doesn't suit some people and it can be very painful to people who can't cope or misunderstand in some way. Yes, because you because because um, well, John Ram says something rather lovely. He says, you know, you, you can't use your old tricks anymore. No, you can't. <laughs> and people feel incredibly threatened initially. Yeah. And vulnerable. Yes. It's, and then, it's scary. And then if you go with it, then you think, wow, but this is like you know, mm. this is freedom that I'm being given. Yeah. And, and you do feel slightly reborn. You're not quite sure who you are. Um, and I think that's that's the danger is that you then, if you're not careful, you can it, it can be so thrilling to find new things and and in rehearsal, particularly, to make Mike happy to to layer up new things and get wonderful notes and thumbs up from him. It's such a, a, a buzz that he kind of liked what you did. I've seen people then, desperately need to do that to the point where they've lost their center mm. and it does become wrong choices bad choices things that don't work and they don't understand when mike says well what were you doing that didn't make sense mm. and you can see them thinking but I, I was trying to be different i was trying to give you what you want and I, i've seen things really miss things really not happen between Mike and the actor. And the actor can, it depends on the personality, but I've seen people be very upset because they don't understand why he isn't pleased. And um, it's, it's an it's a idealistic, almost utopian way of working. Um, it's, it, it, that's, that's why it's glorious, but it's not easy. And at the risk of sounding a bit arrogant, well, very arrogant, if if you're fleet of foot and you have the right talent and to a certain extent taste or awareness of what, I don't know, of, of what, taste is the wrong word, but. I'm going to pick you up on the word taste because this is so interesting because it's been in my head while you've been talking. Because again, um, I haven't put John Ram's um, video up yet, his interview, but at one point he talks about taste mm. and I picked him up on this and I said, you know, well, what do you mean sort of teacups? And and he said, no, 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 it, it, taste is about the world that is being created, the world of the play. Mm. And, you know, Mike concentrates so much on that world, doesn't he? He wants the world to exist. Yes. But within that world, there are certain rules. You know, that there are certain things that, you know, if it's a Chekhov, there are, it's a world. And if it's a mm. whatever, it's another world. Taste, according to John, and this might be echoing what you're saying, is, is when you don't know that you've kind of gone, you've broken that wall yeah. somehow. Yeah, you, you've suddenly lost the trust of the play of the other players you you've you've broken some strange secret rule possibly without meaning to um but you you haven't you haven't stayed within the bounds of what we have all created together and what we have decided is the world we're in um the society and, and the level, you know, I mean, like in uh, Too True to Be Good, I was a kind of quite overtly comic character. And, and some of it is, it's a very strange play. Um, and you could take it quite far. Uh, 
but there were certain things you could you were still in a, a play by Shaw. You had to respect the language. You couldn't just have a free for all. And 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 there were certain mores in the play that you have to be aware of, even if your character then is a bit outrageous and through her innocence breaks them. You have to you have to be aware at any given moment of the world you're in of the responsibility that you carry for the other actors, that you believe in that world, that you share it. You're not just going to trample on it and go, look at me. Mm. And to the trust. And, and that you're, you're telling a story. It's, it's not about you. You can enjoy the ride and have thrilling times, but you are telling something to people out there and I think that's important as well that it's it's for them and that and that somewhere you're you're giving them something through giving each other and in a way you need to be grounded in yourself it, it's not a confidence exactly but it's a kind of awareness of self for the work um, and I was quite young so I wouldn't have always understood that term then now I do in retrospect and I think I had a kind of healthy sense of who I was luckily because the, the going did get quite tough when we went to the national we did oh, yes. a very long thing yeah, and to one me. had to be rooted in in your own soil in who you are um, and your own sense of what's right and what's true not not morally particularly but but in terms of artistically to do with the play to do with the rules that you've set up and sometimes even to do with Mike, so that you didn't try and over-please Mike and desperately need his approbation when you didn't get the note that you thought you'd get, that you were brilliant or that he was a bit sniffy about something you did. Not to be destroyed, to think, well, yeah, okay, he's got a point, but so have I. And that was quite interesting sometimes to 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 pull, not, not badly, but just to be able to take it and go away, dig it back into the work and not think, oh God, he thought I was terrible or he didn't think me, I was so wonderful, wonderful as last week or, you know, just to, um, to own what you're doing, I think. And if you own what you're doing, then you have to take responsibility for it. And that involves taste as well and trust. So you learn all those things working with Mike. He doesn't tell you that, but he shows you, he gives you that. Tell, me about, tell me about, so the first production at the National was The Wandering Jew. Yeah, which was a, a long, very long adaptation of a melodrama by a man called Eugène Sue, who's a 19th century French writer. Very long involved plot, uh, about the Jesuits and beautiful aristocrats and low life. It, it, was, it was extraordinary. I mean, amazing. And there was a leopard and I mean, just thrilling. And again, no um, costumes as such, just, just kind of basics and hardly any props, no scenery. So you had to create it all. And um, yeah, it, it was... <laughs> the first, I mean, if I tell you that the first run, proper run through was nine hours, nine hours, you'll, you'll see what an undertaking it was and that in some ways it was an impossible undertaking. It, it had to be cut severely at that point. And half my part had to go down the plug hole. And I spent about three days with tears pouring down my cheeks in rehearsal in front of my just, how could you I'd learned the whole of Adrienne de Carnouville this, she was this beautiful French aristocrat girl and it was in tatters I, I was mortified and it had to it had to go like half of lots of other people's parts because it was much too long and in in that sense that was not our fault that was Mike's responsibility. And I think there was some, 
you know, some actors were crosser than others about it because it was a huge thing to have learned it all, kind of thinking this is far too long, and then knowing it was, finding out that, it yes, it was too long and all the work. It wasn't wasted at all. Nothing's ever wasted, but it had to be cut by at least half. Mm. And uh, You know, Pam, Pam talked about um, Bleak House and about mm. how they went on tour with the first and then the second and then the third and then the fourth. And, and she said, I think at one point in her interview, you know, she would be coming on with with sort of bits of paper where <laughs> you know, that had been cut or this had been you know but that was over four that was over four yeah four different performances i mean mm. there was i think tw 12 hours worth of bleak house so you never had that luxury because you just, you know you, you could have done it over three nights or something yeah no it was all as i remember it was all one evening one evening um, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing it. Did you? I mean, it was about, it was still about five hours. Yeah, it was long. It, it was much too long, I think. And we were all quite, well, no, I mean, Mark, Mark was in it and I was in it and Sylvester Tuzel. We had the sort of three juve leads, I suppose. Particularly in, in the, the next one we did. Um, not so much in, in uh, I had a lot in both, really. And I think that's why it was just so hard to let go of Adrienne de Cardeville. But it had to be, it had to be. She, you know, there was still quite a lot left. Where did you get the energy from, Sean? I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. You know, but then having said that, where does Mike get the energy from? Well, that, this is the big unknown. This, this is the great mystery of the universe. He's extraordinary and still is and always will be. And, and it is a kind of, Brilliant, obsessive, inspired, generous, life-giving energy, but it's obsessive. Um, I can remember when the the Wandering Jew opened to very mixed reviews because it didn't. It was too long, and I thought it was rather wonderful. And so did several other people who saw it, not just us who were in it. Um, but I, I can see it was too long and, and some of it, there were longers and some of it worked brilliantly and, you know. Um, <laughs> this is very Mike at that time. It was the press night. So we were all on stage waiting for the press night. And Mike came in with this huge stack of scripts and gave us a pep talk about do the work, trust, you know for the press night of The Wandering Jew, and then gave us each three huge scripts there and then for the next play, which was going to be in the Olivier. <laughs> it was a trilogy by Goldoni <laughs> called La Villegiatura in Italian and Country Mania. Yes. Um, and we started rehearsing that almost immediately. And we learned our lesson. I remember thinking, Instead of thinking, oh, goody, I've got, I've got this wonderful part, Vittoria, who's kind of not case. I actually went to Mike and said, do you want to cut it? Cut, I've, I've got too much, cut it. Because I thought, I don't want to have to go through the hell of learning it and loving it and then letting it go. And um, I think he cut quite a lot, bits of uh, all of us. But, yeah, it was a trilogy that I think we'd, most nights we did on one night. Sometimes it was split, possibly. I saw it again, the, the Olivia, the, the, the Goldoni, I saw that in, at the, in the Olivia and it was just the one performance. But again, it was very long. It oh, yeah. Like, oh, know, yeah. Three or four, <laughs> five hours or something. Yeah. Too and, long. Do you know, the audience weren't prepared to... No. They've been at work all day and they're tired. And it, it wasn't for the faint-hearted. Um, but... Some of it was wonderful. I loved being in it. Yeah. I mean, I loved them both. They had very different qualities. And it was a marvellous company. There were some wonderful people there. But, but it was painful. And some people, I think one man left. I can't remember whether he left or sat, but he just did not get it quite early on, <clears throat> I believe. Um, it's usually middle-aged elderly people that just think, uh, no way. And I can see why, 
being middle-aged and elderly myself now it's it's harder to let go of what you the idea of who you you are and the way you work um but it, it was hard and and people there were jealousies developed too uh that were difficult i don't think mike particularly was aware of that why should he be but it, it because we'd all been under a great stress in a way and and a pressure and the wandering jew was on but we were then rehearsing the goldoni i think i don't know i think people get jealous if you appear to be flying on your trapeze and having fun and they're not mm. and it's very easy to find fault if you're not trusting if you're not in a good place you can accuse someone of upstaging you very easily and i was accused of that in a not very pleasant way by someone doesn't matter who um and the thing is maybe they were right you you, you don't intend to but because there's no moves and it's a big cast it's a big stage but it's a big cast on the olivier maybe i was upstaging someone without realizing it um and in a way you're not supposed to say that you're supposed to get yourself out of it that's one of the, the kind of secret rules in a way that i i would never say that to someone in a mike office um in a shared experience production it 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 shows a lack on their part that they're not coping with it yeah. Yeah. and it it may have showed a, an an arrogance and obtuseness on my part not to realize that maybe i was upstaging someone at the wrong time you need to know where the focus has to be at any given moment mm. and that really is hugely important especially when it's a big cast and it's a funny play mm. and and you're playing one of the comic characters you have to be very aware that it's not always your turn and it's someone else's go and <laughs> or when you when it is your big moment and you're just about to really do it a maid comes in and walks right across <laughs> with a thinking i can do what i like because i'm the maid and i'm in my alfred's production and hey look at me and ruins your laugh you know you think hey. but in a way you have to use it you have to then you know if your character is such that she doesn't really like that maid she can make it quite clear that you know you, you can you can use it or just ignore it or move yourself somewhere to a better position yeah but it's um you have to negotiate you have to be very fleet of foot and be able to turn on a sixpence yeah in a in a play and some plays work better for that than others and the larger the cast the harder it is and the danger is that people get competitive in the wrong way not yeah. not in a healthy thrilling way yeah and and if they're exhausted i think yeah. that you know the, that that's the dangerous side and that it becomes a kind of power thing which it isn't mike mike is pure of heart and soul i really feel that he's just the most glorious man but i can see that sometimes he's not even aware of it but there is a lot of power that he holds being who he is and and the knowledge he has and the way that he or is a great almost teacher he he teaches people you learn so much and the danger is that people then want to please him too much and you have to be able to again withstand yeah. that and stand your ground and please yourself as well i think that's really important that's what i learned yeah. to to absolutely get everything i could from mike but to please myself so that i was free and i could stand on a stage and be and exist and not jump through hoops for the sake of it do you, do you know what i mean it's very hard to put into words um, i know exactly what you mean it's not it's not that he made me jump through hoops you jump you make yourself jump it's when you suddenly see people thinking they're doing it and they're walking through mud and you think what are they doing and they they've lost their way with it <clears throat> they've lost their way with themselves within the work and it's very very tricky because then the great great productions that i've seen of mike's 
the, the the very essence of them seems to me that everybody is I, I don't know how, again like you I don't know how to describe it but they're all moving and I don't necessarily mean physically but but they're, they're kind of breathing and thinking and feeling together but there's just it's, this symbiosis between yeah them. and he, he he says it's so important and it, it's sort of easier in someone like a, something like a Chekhov because they're such wonderful plays and there aren't any small parts in that sense, but even in you know whatever the play, if you've not got many words, you're not a small part. You and you feed into where the focus is. You you feed in. You need to know as much as the queen does. Who's going to walk through the door? It, it's important. Your life depends on it. You, everyone shares that moment. That's why the, the stage is alive and breathing, and at any given moment. If something goes wrong, you can catch the cup that fell or mop up the water and not improvise in terms of text particularly, but just use it. I mean, the, I always say with Mike that the the text is very um, solid. It's, it's there. You, you don't muck about with that. It's written by wonderful writers and they don't want I live with one, so you, you know, you, I understand that. They don't want their text mucked about. You learn it. So the what is constant, but the how is infinite. Yeah. And that, on a very basic level, is what's so thrilling and it's sort of overwhelming, I suppose, at times, but thrilling, really, really thrilling. And nothing beats it, and it, it changed my life even when I then had to work with directors very different, which I did actually soon after the next job. Um, it had to end, sadly. We were meant to do a show in each of the auditoria and because it was deemed not successful enough on some levels. Although I have to say, I did get an Olivier nomination for my character in The Gold Only. But, you know, we were playing to tiny houses and who was I? <laughs> but it was kind of like, how bizarre that they've deemed it a big enough flop or not success enough to then let us do the third company, the, the third play. Um, so suddenly we were disbanded and Mark Rylance and I were snapped up by the Royal Court almost immediately, which was great, to do bloody poetry oh, yeah. um, by oh, uh, Howard, Brinton. Howard Brinton, yeah. And Max Steffel Clark directed it. Now, Max is a wonderful director. Don't get me wrong. I have huge respect for him. And I've worked with him several times, and he's taught me a lot. And I think he's a, a great director in many ways. But he's very different from Mike, and the way he works is very different. And this is a, an example of that. He, you will do your actions, but they're all, I never know the difference. Is it transitive or intransitive? It means you, you describe exactly transitive what you're doing to the other person, not just, I do this, that, that. But Mike will just let you just, just name what you're doing. And it's not, you, you never fix anything. So you, le you, you find out through his work how to do that. But with Max, in a way, it makes a play clear and it makes it actor proof. If you've got, you know, someone who's wanking about and being ridiculous or not good enough or lazy, he forces you to work out what it is you're doing at each beat. But it's ter after having done 18 months or whatever with Mike, um, to sit around a table for two or three weeks planning your performance and Max writing it down in tiny little writing. I I pin or I screw or I, you know, whatever it is, every action you think, I don't know. How do I know? Let's get out and find out. You know, it's like the opposite. And at one point, I was playing Mary Shelley and Mark was playing Percy Bish Shelley. And there's a big central scene when they have a, a big row in a way. Or, it's a wonderful scene, two-hander. And we were rehearsing and Max went off to do an important phone call and said, oh, just have a cup of tea, you know. Um, we'll recap when I get back. So we sat there and we were used to really working hard and having quite 
you know, 15 minutes and that's it. And back to work. We were like little kind of racehorses. And after about 15 minutes, either him or me said, I'm really bored. Let's do the scene. So we got up and did the scene in the way we would have done it with Mike. Just let's throw it up and see what happens. Let's do a point of concentration on it. And it, it was going really well. I thought, oh, this is much more interesting. And, ooh, finding stuff out. And we were so busy doing it with performance energy, like that when the door opened and Max walked in, having done his phone call, and stopped and stared and just sat down quietly and waited for us to finish. And we didn't finish till we'd reached the end of the scene. We didn't know just that he was there, let alone what he felt. And he was white hot with anger. He was outraged that we have, how dare we, how could we have possibly been secretly rehearsing this scene behind his back and doing all this work? To him, I mean, it was actually rather good, but that's not the point. It's not what we rehearsed. It's not, I mean, you've been away secretly doing this, planning it. And we said, no, we just made it up now. We've just, we got bored waiting for you. We throw it out and you know, we'll go back to what you want. We were just bored. And he, that's, he couldn't get over that. But that's how we wanted to spend our half hour coffee break. And, and that we hadn't secretly planned it. That, that's, that's the difference. Yeah. And it is quite threatening. And, and it also shows you how different directors are. Max works very hard. And I did learn an awful lot with him, actually, about accuracy and focus and real... Yeah, real focus mm. and truth. But uh, directors don't know what each other get up to. <laughs> actors are the glue. That's a wonderful thing that Ian McKellen says as well. He says, you know, as actors, we get to meet all these directors and we also get to meet other actors and we, mm. we, we feed off actors and then we, we learn this stuff from various directors. And, and it's always the same with teachers. You know, you think... How does a teacher learn? Um, and how does mm. a director learn? Except by going and watching other people working, which they don't do very no. often. You know? um, I mean, there's, a, there's an interesting moment Mike talks about in Lambda, where he, was, where he used to go into the voice classes, he'd go into the movement classes. And I think one of the things that, um, that Mike is very good at is, is kind of letting other people the vo uh, bringing Patsy Rodenberg in or Sue Lefton or somebody and mm. letting them have a real input into the yes. work that's happening and yeah. not feeling threatened by that. Yeah. Not I, not. I could do that and, you know, I don't know why I've got this this voice person here when, you know, which mm, I, I do very much. Very territorial about what they, what they do. You know, he, he was wonderful at bringing in other people. We did incredible work with Sue, particularly on uh, on the Wandering Jew, for instance. Just wonderful, and that, that's what I love about Mike. He he delights in in people's work. Yeah, he just he has he just beams, and he, he almost cries with joy when you're doing something that that works. Um. I can, it, it's it's very moving. It's 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 truly generous. That's why when things go wrong, it's it well, things go wrong in life, you know. But it's not him. He, I suppose, he should have known that those plays would would have been too long, and Peter Hall gave him enough rope to hang himself with in some ways, but. Maybe Peter Hall shouldn't have said, do what you want. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. There's something glorious about Mike. That's all I know. And that he, it is a kind of idealistic way of working. Mm. That when it does work, when people really get it, it there's nothing like it. No. There's never been anything like it. I think that's why, for me, I mean, I, I say this in my introduction, this is why... Um, you know, I, 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 I fell into 
science fictions at the ICA by accident. I've seen that. And I just, I just laughed and laughed and laughed. And I just, and then I was working at the Crucible and I mm. saw their Cymbeline. And that was it, you know, I was a yeah. complete groupie because <laughs> you know, this work yeah. was just so phenomenal and so just like nothing I'd ever seen before. Yeah, but that, that's how I felt when I saw the seagull. It, it kind of embraces your heart. You, you feel utterly embraced and disarmed by yeah. everybody on the stage yeah. and, and the fact that everyone is so alive. It's, it's that absolute, yeah. they've all done the work and they've all shared each other's characters. That's what I find so moving and wonderful. And, and to have the time to do that, you do need time. But you know, every single person became Vittoria, whatever her name was, my character in the Gold Only, for instance. And you get such a wonderful sense of community from that, that everyone's taken time out to listen to your long lists and think about it. Where is her point of her, her physical centre? And hmm, what sort of animal is she? And then everyone goes off and just is Vittoria for a bit on their own. And I'm, Mike takes you around looking and, and no one's showing off and they're not interacting and they're not using words. They're just Vittoria doing her toilette or whatever it is she's doing. And you just get such ideas from a 70 year old man being silly teenage Vittoria or you know it, it's 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 thrilling if anyone can play anything really and um, that's a kind of wonderful example that everyone can feed in to your character so you have you just yeah it is shared at its best it's shared totally all right Sean I think we'll bring this to a close all right this has been such a pleasure Thank you. It has, yes, thank you, it has. It's been lovely. And we'll talk again. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that, uh, that chat. And if you did, would you press the like button and also um, the, uh, the subscribe button, that would be great. And if you wanted to be given alerts to when the next one is happening, just press the bell button. Um, if you want to put any comments or any questions underneath here, underneath the video, please do. And at some point I will um, re-interview Mike, as it were, and put some of these questions to him. So um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.